Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Aspen Author Webinar Series. Today's topic is Teaching Civil Procedure in the 21st Century, Avoiding Swamps and, and Walking in Pleasant Valleys. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to review. The audio for this webcast is through the internet only. I highly recommend that you use a headset or earbuds or make sure you're listening to this presentation through your laptop or mobile speakers. Secondly, this is a one-way communication channel. You can hear us, but we cannot hear you. So if you have any questions, please use the chat. And now I will hand it over to Joanne to introduce today's presenters. Thanks so much, Aspen, and thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm Joanne Butler, and I'm the managing editor for the Doctrinal List here at Aspen Publishing. I have the great fortune to work with an amazing team of legal scholars to develop learning resources for first year law students. It's my honor to be able to introduce you today to the co-authors of Civil Procedure, soon to be in its 11th edition and our presenters today. Stephen Yazel is Professor of Law Emeritus at the UCLA School of Law. He writes about the history, theory, and dynamics of modern civil litigation. He served as Associate Dean of the Law School as chair of the UCLA Academic Senate and as interim dean of the School of Law. Uh, Professor Yazel is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Joanna Schwartz is professor of law at UCLA School of Law. She teaches civil procedure, the civil rights litigation clinic, and a variety of courses on police accountability and public interest lawyering. Professor Schwartz is one of the country's leading experts on police mis misconduct litigation and has also looked more broadly at how lawsuits influence decision making in a variety of organi organizational settings. Maureen Carroll is professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School. She teaches and writes about civil procedure, class actions, and civil rights litigation. Professor Carroll is particularly interested in how procedure, substantive law, and the structure of the legal profession interact to define the scope of access to justice for identity-based discrimination and other broadly shared injuries. So I'm really excited to have you all today um, and I'm gonna turn it over to our team of authors to discuss some swampy questions. Take it away team. Well, I'll get started. I'm Joanna Schwartz and uh, so thrilled that you are all here joining us um, and thrilled that we get a chance to speak with you all a little bit about uh, this new edition of the book. Um, as Joanne mentioned, this, this book is uh, has been around for uh, decades. Uh, Steve Yazel has been um, has helmed the um, the the, the work on his own for the vast majority of that time. But uh, luckily for me, he, he brought me in um, about eight years ago to uh, begin working with him on uh, the case book. And then we are really thrilled that Maureen uh, has joined us for this most recent edition. Um, one thing I can tell you about working with Steve is uh, that he is very um, excited always and open to new developments to the book, to thinking about how to improve it, to think about how to make the book really speak to the moment um, that uh, we are in as there are doctrinal developments, but also uh, developments in the realities of civil litigation and with the realities of society and, and life. And uh, in this most recent edition, as with um, the, the ones prior, um, we have uh, really thought about how best to update the book. And um, we thought we would spend this hour with you talking a bit about some of the questions that we wanted to make sure to try to answer uh, in this most latest uh, edition of the book. And these are questions that have come to us uh, as scholars and researchers, but also as teachers of civil procedure who are using this book, um, as hopefully many of you are or will, uh, to try to teach this material. 
apologies for my, my dog is taking exception to that, I guess. Uh, anyway, our first, um, the, the three questions that we wanted to talk with you about um, begin with uh, the, the first swampy question about uh, how to prevent personal jurisdiction from eating the whole course. And um, I think the plan is that that we'll, we'll divvy up sort of first, first dibs at responding to each of these questions, but then um, th we will all jump in uh, as we do when we're talking through any issues. Um, and then uh, we'll open it up to hear your questions about these topics or any other swampy questions or, or other kinds of questions that you might be interested in asking. So the first question that was certainly on our minds uh, that we knew we needed to answer in this edition was how to deal with personal jurisdiction. Uh, and um, the, the personal jurisdiction cases coming that have come out of the Supreme Court, important personal jurisdiction cases, could could take up an entire uh, four hour course, four credit course, if you gave um, you know, uh, significant time to, to uh, unraveling them all. We know that that was not what we wanted to do. And there are so many other uh, important aspects of the course to teach. And also uh, simply um, that the, the, the cases have uh, you know, gone down many sort of swamps, <laughs> swamps of their own. And uh, we wanted to be able to streamline the material so that students could get a sense of the complexities without getting completely enmeshed in them. So we've done that in a couple of different ways. One um, began a couple of editions ago. One of Steve and uh, my colleagues, uh, Clyde Spillinger, who is a wonderful um, legal historian along with many other uh, talents um, was willing to share with us and to have us share with you a uh, historical primer that went quickly through um, really from Panoyer to um, International Shoe to describe, is it, is it, was it past International Actually, further than that, he takes it through Schaefer. Oops, through Schaefer, excuse me. That that describes the history, um, describes the the environment, the, the sort of social changes also during the period of time, and brings people up to at least that um, that moment, uh, so that you know the people who are choosing to to trying to cut down the the personal jurisdiction part of the course can can use that material. This edition, we have gone one step further, which is to, to, to streamline the cases that are um, in the book, to really uh, figure out how to um, really get to the core parts of the cases um, with some more robust editing uh, so that students can really um, you know, click into what the, the critical issues are and the shifts in personal jurisdiction doctrine over the years without um, some of the excess uh, aspects of those decisions that you know we have found in our own experience uh, are places where students can get distracted or lost. And we really look forward to um, teaching with these materials. I actually, I think I've taught with them. Uh, I taught with them uh, in, a, in a, you know, modified form previously. But we really look forward to your experiences and hope that uh, it's a useful um, it's a useful addition or subtraction for for you and your courses. Can I I want to add two words to to, to that, uh, uh, Joanna? Thank you for that wonderful summary. Um, the first really is a pitch that um, it's important for all of us to keep the personal jurisdiction stuff somewhat confined because the rest of the course, that is how you, we decide disputed questions of law and fact, that's material they will get in no other course really and is at the core of the American legal system. So unless we stop this metastasis, um, uh, we will chew up uh, all the available time uh, and the, the students won't get this irreplaceable material. I guess the other thing I would add, and this is, I think Maureen has done even more radical surgery than we have. Maureen, what do you do? 
personal jurisdiction in a sort of eye blink. How do you do it? I have uh, one full day on personal jurisdiction. Um, oh, another well, on notice and service, I, another well, on venue, but only one that is strictly about personal jurisdiction. And you just talk very fast <laughs> or what? Tell us. Uh, I, cover, I cover just an overview of general and specific jurisdiction. I use mm -hmm. um, a version of uh, what became the Streamline chapter uh, for this version of the casebook. Mm -hmm. Um, although I do mention personal jurisdiction throughout the course, I start with the process of litigation. So from the very beginning, we're talking about you know, where are you going to file the lawsuit? And when you get to responding to the complaint, it's how do you raise personal jurisdiction as a defense? So by the time they get to, it's I think week nine uh, or week 10, when I finally mm -hmm. have case law about personal jurisdiction mm -hmm. specifically, it's not like it's a brand new concept to them. It's just that uh, getting all the details of it is new to that day. And what cases do you spend wow. in your in your day uh, what, about personal and uh, specific and general jurisdiction? What do you what cases do you assign? So I think last time around I did um, international shoe and Bristol Myers Squibb as the primary okay. cases. And presumably this time you do Ford. Yes, because yeah. that's how. They escape from this exactly. one they swim. <laughs> yes, and if you, I mean, we we of course have Ford um, in the materials uh, in the in the new chapter, um, and the book itself travels. You know, for, you know, gives you material to spend more than more than a day, uh, well more than a day on those topics. I end up spending about a week on on specific and general jurisdiction. Uh, and there's certainly material for that. You could probably make it longer if if you were so inclined. But uh, I think the the end result will be at least at, in, for this moment, uh, for this edition, will be Ford, um, and the, the other materials help explain how we got there, or at least explain what the court's uh, rationale has been along the way. Well, maybe we should turn to our second our second topic about. Okay. Uh, unrepresented litigants. I think, Steve, you were going to take it away. Sure. Sure. This will be relatively short uh, because, you'd be sorry to learn, I don't really have a solution, but I, I think it's a problem worth talking about. I've, over a series of conferences and various things over the last year or so, I've become aware of the circumstance that in state courts, where, of course, 98% of litigation takes place, an astonishing proportion of litigants, mostly but not entirely defendants, are unrepresented. I think it is something like half of all defendants. Now, why is, how does one think about that in, in procedure? I think there are two really important points. The first is we designed a litigation system to be party driven, uh, to that, and that typically means lawyer driven. Um, but what do you do when the people who are in the system have no idea? I mean, federal judges file scheduling orders for cutting off discovery. Well, think of a litigant who doesn't know what discovery is. How could you possibly run a system like that? So I kind of try to pose it. I talk early on uh, about, you know, kind of two great legal systems in the world, one being kind of party driven, the other being judge driven. Um, and the, the question is, what do you do when a party driven system suddenly loses lawyers for most litigants? And I guess there are, seem to be two answers emerging. Uh, one is some states have uh, Utah is notable here uh, as uh, sort of on the forerunner, uh, are certifying what you might call paralegals, but certainly not fully licensed lawyers. They're certifying them to do limited representation of uh, litigants in court. So that's one answer. You, you, you continue with a party driven system and but try to create, lower the barriers to at least some form of representation. Uh, obviously, the more complicated the cases get, the harder that is. The other possible direction, which would be really quite radical for us, is 
to turn things over more to judges, to move in the direction of something more like the civil law system where judges, not parties, have responsibility for developing the case. I haven't seen that happening, but maybe some of you will or will be, will be seeing it as time goes forward. And, and again, I, I, there's not much material in the book about this. We do point to it as a problem, but I think if one is thinking about civil procedure in the 21st century, that's going to become a more and more uh, pressing problem. And, and if it continues, it's really going to deprive the whole litigation system of legitimacy. If you half the people in it haven't any clue how to operate it, it's very hard to, to justify the results as, as sound or fair or just. Uh, so that's a terrible problem. Um, it's a problem that I think all of us as scholars and teachers will need to think about a bit. Um, I, do, I wish I could say I had a great solution. The two that I've mentioned are at least the possibilities that occur to me. Maybe there will be others and you know, your students will be the ones who have to figure out how to cope with this, I think. So that's a very short uh, summary of a very, very tough problem. And with that, we turn it over to Maureen for easy problems. <laughs> Well, I'll say a little bit more about unrepresented litigants, if that's all right. So sure. um, one thing from a from a teaching perspective, uh, one thing I like to explain to students is that you're going to be going up against unrepresented litigants as, as someone who is representing a party. And it is surprisingly difficult to explain why an incorrect yes. assertion is incorrect when it's really off mm -hmm. base. So uh, the ABA has been pushing for more formative assessments. And I think a good form of that is explain why this incorrect assertion is is incorrect um, because they they quickly start to see how that is is more difficult than it seems um, the other thing I wanted to add is that it's it's worth addressing I think the the reasons why there is um, a, a, a dearth of access to counsel right and I think the the book doesn't directly talk about unrepresented litigants that much, but it does um, sort of come at it sideways a little bit with things like um, talking about how fee shifting statutes work and when fee shifts are and are not available, uh, talking about the cost of legal services. And if you combine questions about the cost of legal services with questions about calculating remedies, if someone is, is making minimum wage and they've lost a year's worth of work, that's still less than $15,000 and a, a 30% contingent fee for that isn't going to add up to much. Yeah, I would I would add in uh, there that I do think something I've loved about the book since before I was uh, involved in uh, in writing it was the is the um, repeated sort of reflection and reality of the the costs of bringing a case and and peppered throughout. The book, uh, certainly in um, chapter five, which I think is a really important chapter about the demographics of civil disputes in our country, um, and as well in uh, the chapter that sort of talks about resolution before trial, there there is a discussion of how much it would how much it would cost to defend against a case if you have been sued. Um, and why it might simply make sense to, even if even if a defendant has done nothing wrong, why it might make sense to just pay a settlement when getting an attorney, hiring an attorney, would be more expensive than than the than the payment. And on the other side, situations where a plaintiff has clearly been wronged, but the value of their claim would not would not uh, be enough uh, to justify hiring a lawyer. So those dynamics, I think, uh, show up. In, in multiple places in the book. I also let me let me piggy, oh, I was going to piggyback on something uh, Maureen said. It's a it's a variation on um, how you show something is is wrong. Um, if you if when one talks to lawyers, uh, one finds that it, it you you one thinks as a law student I did 
that you know it would be great to be a, up against an incompetent lawyer but if you talk to real lawyers it's a nightmare because you've got to teach them how to do their job and then you've got to defeat them doing so the unrepresented litigant is a is a subset of the or the incompetent lawyer maybe is a is a adversary is a subset of the uh, problem represented by the unrepresented uh, and it's also a time i'm sure maureen and that you do this you know, went to for if you were were up against an unrepresented litigant, to, you know, to think about what your ethical responsibilities to the system are. Um, so, there's there's one other point that I wanted to make, which is about a, that it's that it's sort of inspired by this conversation about unrepresented litigants and and the fact that it uh, sort of reflects an aspect of of litigation that is um, not typically. Um, thought of or anticipated in a course on civil procedure. I actually think there's there's a lot of ways in which there are a lot of types of dispute resolution um, that happen outside the world of federal the federal rules of civil procedure. Um, certainly, all of the disputing that happens in state courts, uh, but also mediation and arbitration. Um, and I, I think it it is important to let students know that that litigation is all of litigation or all of dispute resolution is not reflected in the federal rules of civil procedure and i think that uh, our casebook does a nice job of um, teeing up some of those limitations that then can be used along with um, this kind of discussion about unrepresented litigants to really further define what the scope of the course is and all of the interesting questions that lay outside that scope. All right, so Maureen, now let's let's talk about some of the, um, the hardest uh, questions um, uh, that, that often emerge in civil procedure uh, about race, class, inequality, um, and your thoughts about how to um, incorporate those those issues into your class and how we've, you know, how we've managed this with the casebook. Sure. So um, in, in my syllabus, in my learning outcomes at the very beginning, I actually list this as one of the learning outcomes. So I want students to be able to understand how facially neutral procedures can have disparate effects based on characteristics like race, sex, and socioeconomic status. Um, I feel like that's an important thing to do because it sort of sets the tone from the beginning that this, this is an extra. This isn't something that's sort of tacked on and not really central to the course. It's really key. Um, the One of the things I like about the book is that it's geared towards thinking about procedure as uh, a course about litigation strategy. And when you think about preparing someone to be a good lawyer, someone who is thinking about procedure from the perspective of practice and being a good, uh, a good practitioner, um, one of the things that they will need to do is to be able to work across difference. So every single one of our students is going to work with someone of a different race or gender identity or sexual orientation or all of the above um, as a colleague or a client. Um, and so I think also it's um, the, the cases we cover and the way we cover them should sort of reflect the way the world looks. So we've done that in this edition of the case book through, uh, in part through some case selection decisions. So we've added Detroit Will Breathe as, the, as a temporary restraining order case, um, which is about, uh, about excessive force uh, during the, the uprisings uh, after George Floyd's murder. Um, there's also some choices in fact patterns, uh, both in the casebook and um, in some fact patterns I use outside the casebook, um, where it's, it's good if sort of, if someone is reading the fact pattern, they get a sense, or in just some of the hypotheticals and the notes and questions, if they get a sense that they're seeing the world as it is and not some sort of whitewashed version of it. So for example, there is a, a doctor who used to be Marcus Welby and now is Christina Yang. And there's some characters who are uh, characters from How to Get 
away with murder who if someone uh, also a great show um, if someone is familiar with that show they'll recognize those uh, those characters as people of color um, so it's the more that sort of the, the the hypothetical people can be recognizable as diverse across various dimensions the better um, there's also in this version of the casebook more explicit discussion of of race in the cases that are already there. So, for example, in um, in Toland B. Cotton, there's an excerpt from Robbie Toland's memoir when he talks about um, what the case meant to him and how it ended, and and takes on some of those issues more explicitly, which can be can be pretty uncomfortable to talk about as a professor. And I think I think it's fine to acknowledge that discomfort. Um, so. Uh, and because some students are going to be experiencing that discomfort too. Um, and to really emphasize, this is not because we want to have some sort of an abstract discussion about issues of inequality. This is because I want you all to be excellent lawyers. And this is something that you need to be able to do in order to be an excellent lawyer. So let me toss in, a, this is a, 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 a plug uh, for doing this really from the very beginning. So if for those of you who teach the introductory chapter, the very first case, um, Hawkins against Masters Farms, it's a diversity case from North, or they tried to make it into a diversity case. And what I try to bring out in discussion is that the reason the plaintiff's lawyer very, very badly wanted to have this case tried in Topeka and not in this little tiny uh, town in North uh, East Kansas probably had to do not with race, but with other characteristics of the plaintiff. It's, it's about class. He's uh, unaffiliated loner. Uh, he's four times divorced in a town that has lots of churches in the, in the little town. And so by and from the very beginning talking about social factors that aren't directly race, I think it opens up a conversation that this is a broader question about, as Maureen says, differences and, and in this case, probably jockeying for strategic advantage. The defendants, defendant who was a well-known pillar of the community probably wanted this tried in the little town in northwest eastern Kansas where he was known as a pillar of the community and the plaintiff, the deceased plaintiff was a, a loner and, and uh, probably not a pillar of the community. So it, by, by starting it not directly about race, I hope it makes it easier to segue into other kinds of characteristics about gender, about uh, class, and certainly about yeah, and I, I would I agree with everything that you both have said. I would I would add that to me uh, the what makes I, I think that that students my experience is that students have the lowest expectations of civil procedure among their first year <laughs> courses. A bunch of rules. It's the secret yes, sauce. And if it's not dead on arrival, you've done wonderful. Exactly. <laughs> you know, there's such low expectations. There's nowhere to go but up and part of the way that I try to go up <laughs> is by um, making clear that these are not just dry rules. They're, they are, you know, they are rules, if, if they're rules of a game uh, and the game is, you know, has incredibly high stakes, certainly higher than, you know, your average game of Parcheesi. Um, the, the stakes are, are truth and justice and, and, you know, and, and all sorts of other important things. And that lawyers who know how to use these tools uh, end up getting being more successful for their clients. But the background of all of these disputes really are the, the disputes themselves are really part of the fabric of our society and and what is what is happening uh, in the world and and uh, and in order to understand the importance of these seemingly dry rules. Part of what part of the way to make the rules come alive is to have the cases and the disputes come alive. And part of the way to have the cases and disputes come alive is to really understand in full dimension what these disputes are and why they are so important and what the stakes are. 
And when you get to those questions, you really can't avoid questions of race and class and inequality because they are baked in, not to every single case that we have, you know, when Dr. Stradford tries to, you know, get extra money from his insurance company, um, you know, those those questions don't always come to the to the fore, but they- Do you know what race Dr. Stradford was? What's that? Do you know what race Dr. Stradford was? Af African American. Ooh, well, there you have it. Um, but it's no, not, but the, you know, these are yet. these are there are questions that that arise more more readily from some cases than others. But I think that yes. in if you can think of it not as boy, are we going to touch the third rail conversation about race or class or gender identity today, and instead think well. The, the way in which students are going to appreciate the importance of this rule and the importance of this case is really understanding what these stakes are. And I think one of the ways we try to make that is, I don't think this is a great secret, but where we can, we've chosen district court rather than appellate court cases, which get you a little closer to the social fabric that you're talking about, a little closer to sort of the on the ground, uh, rather than the sort of abstract principles that tend to be dominate for understandable and good reasons the appellate cases well i well does that take us through our major stuff i think, I think so Anna? i think now would be you know these are these were three issues that uh we wanted to throw out and discuss as uh, things that had been on our minds and hopefully this conversation about uh, our thought process uh, has been useful to you, but we're also really eager to answer your questions uh, that you may have about this edition or, or anything else. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I do want to remind everybody that we have now reached our kind of Q&A portion. If you have a question or a comment to please utilize the chat feature. And it looks like we have one already in, so we'll get started. Uh, students typically shudder in horror when they look at the rules and statues supplement. How do you unfreeze them and get them to see the rules as something other than arbitrary and menacing? Well, let me have a swing at that. I've been uh, dealing with this for since 1975 when I started to teach the course. Uh, I think the something it's something we've already hinted at. Um, it helps enormously if you can, first of all, you tell them that, you know, you're not going to have to memorize this. You will have it with you in the exam. No good lawyer tells you what the rule is off the top of her head. Uh, you'll always consult the text. That's the first thing. The second thing is to begin to think of the rules as tools for implementing a strategy. Again, to use the very first case, the defendant's lawyer didn't challenge federal subject matter jurisdiction because he was deeply interested in the division of power between the states and the federal government in 1789. He challenged it because he thought that his client was going to be in a better position if he tried the case in this little town or little county in northwestern Kansas. And again and again and again, um, the, the, the rule is something that's being used to implement a strategy. And the, the soonest students begin to say that, if you get that over, they begin to say, oh, this is sort of interesting. And you're off and running at that point. I find it also helps to uh, talk about uh, the rules as something that that were written and that have been amended. Um, and that was passive voice, right. but we have a nice a nice little discussion in the casebook about who the rule makers are, uh, because thinking about who the rule makers are helps to drive home. These are all decisions that that people made, that human beings made. And so some of them are probably incorrect or, or bad decisions, unwise decisions. And some of them have gone back and forth. Uh, and some of them seem like 
like, well, how would you do it any differently? And some of them seem like they should just affect all cases the same way. And then you see things like, oh, it turns out rule 11 doesn't have the same impact on civil rights cases as on contract cases. Um, so that's right. that's interesting yeah. to get into. And fight about amending these rules. We've just been through, you know, on the, with the proportionality duels uh, in the discovery stuff. That was a a major fight between big law and the plaintiff's bar where it looks like it might be a draw, but it's not clear. Um, and, and especially with the modern rules processes for amending the rules, um, you, get, you get really enormous fights. I also try to get students comfortable with the book. I mean, I, I with the rules. I, I do. I do everything that that uh, Steve was talking about, making telling students every year they don't have to memorize these rules. Um, and uh, I think it's a something that bears repeating probably multiple times during the course. But one thing I really like um, and use in the in the book uh, is is having students work through some of the of the problems, the the problem sets. Um, that really require students to get into the rule book and understand how the rules work together. So every year I have I break students up into groups and have them go through some of the questions that are in uh, about Rule 12 and uh, you know what kinds of Rule 12 motions can be brought at the beginning and which kinds of motions can be brought later and which motions can be brought together um, and and simply and I I, I do that you know, a couple of different times in the course with with different parts of the rules that uh, that are particularly um, dense. And I think getting students to really actively go through those rules and come up with answers demystifies them to some extent because they realize they can figure it out. They can look at the rule. Um, and, you know, it, it, we also talk about ways in which uh, you know, the rule drafters could be clearer and, you know, what they actually meant if you, you know, if you um, tried to rewrite, you know, these rules for clarity. Um, and, and that's just simply another way, I think, of getting students to, to not be afraid of the rules and to, to have a more sort of active engagement with them. Okay. Um, our next question is, uh, how in a very short course most of us have just four semester hours. Do you do anything with Joinder? So, Professor Carroll, I think you have at least one answer for that. I'll we'll listen to you and then I'll toss in two seconds. So there's um, uh, the other class, the other lecture class I teach is complex litigation. So uh, I mention uh, complex Joinder early and often, and I tell them that they should definitely take complex litigation because it's a very important course. Um, but also, I do, uh, at the end of the course, I do one day on simple joinder and one day on class actions to sort of give them the nutshell version of this is how you decide, how you think about the strategic implications of having more than one plaintiff uh, and or defendant on the complaint in the case and what the rules are for that. And then well, what if you don't have them all on the complaint, but you want somebody to be standing in for someone else? How does that change everything? Um, and that sort of opens the the subject and um, and hopefully gets them interested in more. By by simple joinder, you uh, want to you do uh, rule twenty joinder of plaintiffs and defendants, or do you can do counterclaims in there too? Uh, just or? simple joinder, uh, just um, plaintiffs and defendants, just rule twenty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, next question is. Students hear a lot about federal court in the news, but they don't come to the classroom understanding its significance. Is there anything you'd recommend as a way to get the students to understand why litigants and lawyers care so much about the fe about federal court versus state court? The whole premise for the material on the subject matter jurisdiction is that it matters a lot. And I'm wondering how to effectively convey why it matters. Yeah, I think it. I think there are. I, I think this is a great question, and I think that the answer uh, can depend based on the dispute. Um, I think it's one thing that we mention in the book. There, there are some. There are some people who uh, and some litigants who would much prefer to be in state court um, than in federal court. Um, and uh, you, you know, the, the 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 different sides can um, different different 
litigants in, under different circumstances can have different points of view. I tend to get to that issue during the first week of class, during the discussion of Hawkins versus Masters Farms. And uh, there are some material in the first chapter that I think does a nice job of, of setting up what, what some of the differences are in terms of the, the stakes. Uh, when we talk, because in Hawkins versus Masters Farms, the defendant wants the case heard in state court and the plaintiff wants it heard in, heard in federal court. And we sort of think through some reasons why that could be. Um, certainly the points that Steve uh, was describing before about having a broader jury pool in federal court who might not be as um, uh, sympathetic to the um, defendant in that case. But the that chapter also talks a bit about the different ways in which judges are selected, um, the different ways that juries are selected, the different different procedural rules that can um, apply in those um, different uh, jurisdictions. And one thing I get to when when we talk about Hawkins versus Masters Farm after we have gone through some of those different reasons why it matters is to point out that we don't actually know for certain why Hawkins where wants to be where 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 his his um, estate wants to be in federal court and why Masters Farms wants to be in state court, but we do know that they really care and they care so much that they have taken depositions, they've exchanged discovery about the question of where um, where Creel, who's the decedent, uh, where he kept his clothes and where he where he registered his car and all of these things. And not only that, they 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 briefed the they did the discovery, they did depositions, they briefed the the issues, um, and this is all just about whether the case is going to be brought in state or federal court. So we know that they care. We can't put our finger on exactly why. Uh, we know the procedural rules are different and the, jur the jury selection process and the judges are different, um, but we know they care. They must care a lot uh, in order to go through this whole process. And let me just throw a footnote into uh, Joanna's thing. There's a, I can't remember which chapter it's cited in, but there's a wonderful debate or pair of set pieces that are 40 years apart. Uh, one Bert Newborn who asserted this in the late 70s that always his civil rights clients would always, always, always uh, prefer to be in federal court, that federal judges were more sympathetic to federal civil rights claims and so on and so on. And then 40 years later, along comes Bill Rubenstein, who was, had represented a series of gay clients who asserted that by and large, his clients and his, he would agree, wanted to be in state court where the judges were more in touch with the sort of everyday life and would like more likely to have had experience with uh, uh, gay litigants and, and gay colleagues. And so it isn't a uh, one way, it isn't that, oh, we always want to get to the feds. It really is uh, case specific. And that's just, and, and but in, so you have two distinguished civil rights litigators writing three or four decades apart, with very different answers to that same question. Great. Um, all right, so the next question is, in your 1L course, do any of you attempt to teach the entire book? If not, what information do you omit? Yeah. Uh, no, I can, I think I can. <laughs> no, um, I'll take a swing at it, and Maureen and Joanna. So, uh, well, one thing for sure I omit, I've never taught a chapter on appeals. Uh, I think Maureen does a little bit more with it than I do. Uh, I try to, in the first chapter, try to make the point that the final judgment rule, um, which looks just like a timing rule, is in fact a rule which will bar from ever being appealed uh, most cases. Uh, so I do a little bit with that. Uh, Maureen, you do a little bit more. What what do you do on the appeals side? And then I guess we can talk about what else we can Yeah, have. so I cover the final judgment rule and I cover a little bit on standards of review um, to, to get students a, a sense of sort of not just the different function between appellate and trial courts, but the idea that even if it does get to the point of an appeal, there's a lot that uh, that the district court can do that is um, that's going to be untouched. Um, 
So to go back to the, the fuller que question, uh, we've already by implication said that uh, we don't have time to do much with Joinder. Uh, heaven forbid that they will ever get an interpleader case. Uh, um, and, and I touch, I do a little bit of basic Joinder, probably a little bit more than Marine does, but not much. Uh, so no, for me, no appeals and, and limited coverage of Joinder. For me, that comes at the very end, and so it's a place where I can either add or cut depending on what time constraints look like. Do yeah, I, I so I um, I teach the I do teach um, that first chapter, um, and in the first mm -hmm. chapter, which I do in a week, uh, I, I I find that I get a lot of value from that from that discussion. Um, I'm able to talk about Erie. Um, because there's an eerie issue that comes up in the first week's materials. Uh, and I'm also able to talk about appeals uh, because there's, an, there's a final judgment rule case that, that comes up in that first week and some and a brief discussion of final judgment rule and standards of review on appeal. So I really take care of, um, of eerie and uh, the final mm -hmm. judgment rule and, and by implication appeals in that first week. And then I I move to um, the life of a lawsuit, um, the demographic chapter five, the demographics of, of litigation, and then filing a complaint and discovery and, and resolution before trial. And I and I and I do really um, all of that. I don't do trial um, and I really don't don't do it all except for uh, judgment notwithstanding the verdict. Um, I don't do things like j judge uh, recusal or um, jury selection. And then I don't do appeal and I do just a little bit of joinder. Uh, and I've and I've increasingly taught less of joinder as time has gone on because it feels like it's a it's a Pandora's box. You can you can teach, you know, a, I don't really tend to get past rule 14, um, you know, 18, 20 and 14. And then I, you know, I, I'm, I'm 24 if I have time, but I, but I usually, uh, I, I don't always. So um, I, I think the joinder issues are, are ones where I, it really depends on how much time I have left. And maybe this is a time to put in a small plug for the teacher's manual where we have a bunch of syllabi, all of which are, do a lot of cutting. Uh, in various places and sort of give you some choices about where to cut. Great plug. Um, okay, so the ABA standards now require some formative assessment in all courses. How do you approach this task? So we have um, the, the questions and answers at the end of each chapter. Um, I don't require students to do them, but I make sure that they know from the very beginning that those are available because those are um, those are places where they can sort of gauge their own understanding, which I think is really useful. Um, during class, I use um, polling software. I use Poll Everywhere, but uh, some of my colleagues use Mentimeter and I've used other things in the past too, um, where I, I go through a fact pattern and ask them questions about it. Um, that's, that's sort of the same uh, process as they'll see on the exam. So someone files a complaint and then someone files this motion and that motion and, and um, gives them multiple choice answers and lets them see how they're doing. I do that, and I've recently, in addition to the questions at the back of the chapter, uh, I've at the end of each chapter, I make up my own set of multiple choice sort of variations on those, and um, I hand hand them out. I have not, I haven't figured out the software yet, Maureen. When I do, I'll use that. But it's just a, a piece of paper with multiple, and I encourage them go through those there'll be the eight or nine questions multiple choice um often with several answers being correct and i encourage them to talk with each other as they're doing it so they're getting a little bit of the collaboration that they'll be doing for the next 50 years of their career and then if there are questions uh, that uh, and there inevitably are uh, uh you know well, what about this and what about this and if this isn't just a bad question that i've written 
uh, it smokes out stuff where either I've not been clear or they don't understand that they don't understand. My, our, my colleague across the hall, Patrick Goodman, has this wonderful phrase, uh, which he says describes a lot of what happens in the first year of law school. It's the illusion of the false illusion of mastery or the illusion of false mastery, where you walk out of class and you think, oh, I got that. But then you get asked a question about it and it turns out yeah, maybe you don't have it. And this is a moment at which they can realize that they haven't quite got hold of it. So I do that and also I'll give them a midterm, which I'll uh, give individual comments on. Yeah, I, I would just pick up on the last point in addition to, to uh, what uh, Steve and Maureen have said. I do give a, a midterm, an ungraded midterm as well and, and give a model answer and then meet with students. But, and this is taking a page from, from the point that Steve made a moment ago, I um, require them to talk to each other and, and review at least one other person's midterm um, before they meet with me. <laughs> uh, because what I want them to do is see, see what, what someone else has done and, and not just to look at the model answer, um, but to take a look at somebody else's and, and to give feedback to them and to receive feedback from them um, as a way of you know, getting them to think proactively for themselves about what you know where they fell short and i also require that they uh, write me to sort of lay out not in any super detailed way but but what they think they did well and what they think they did uh less less well uh and this is just a, a two two ways that i am trying to instill some reflection on their own part because before i started creating the having those additional requirements i did find that students often came in and just simply wanted to know you know how to how to get an a or <laughs> you know how to fix it uh, and and really it's important for them to just to, to figure these things out um more for themselves at least to take a first crack themselves so i think i have not done that joanna but i think i will because it's brilliant and it also helps them or it helps you answer the question that you will always get. Well, what are you looking for? Well, what I'm looking for is a clearly expressed answer which analyzes the, identifies the issues and analyzes them clearly. And they can see that when they read other people's papers. Uh, you know, once they you distance them a little bit from their own paper, uh, you know, what did I do wrong? So I think that's a brilliant. Well, I don't know if you see really, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say one thing that Steve, you you gave me um, some years back was a sample of that you had written of yes. an A answer, a yes. B answer, and a C answer um, to a single question. Yes. And yes. I think it was it it was wisely and 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 caringly not taken from actual exams, but something that Steve no. had written no. up himself <laughs> to just to just illustrate what a complete answer is, and then you know, ones that are, are less and less complete. And, and they can immediately see, they don't have any difficulty. Now, I've made it easy for them not to have any difficulty. They don't have any difficulty seeing why this one is superior and, you know, what are you looking for? Well, I want you to identify the issues and discuss them clearly. So, yeah, I think I commend it. You guys, everybody can do that. You, you've seen enough, you know, things that you can easily imitate the not so great answers. I don't know if UCLA uses Canvas, but Canvas has a, a really nice peer review feature where if if you do um, text submissions, I have students do three hypos um, and I give them um, three hypos that are practice exam questions over the course of the semester and I give them a sample answer in a rubric. But one thing I do is I have I have them automatically given uh, anonymously three other students answers to each of the hypo oh, that they need brilliant. to look at um and i have them grade it um but that's not actually the important part the important part is that they look carefully at someone else's answer so that they can see what choices they made that they didn't realize they were making so i'm struggling to learn canvas myself so maybe i'll call i'll have a side call with you maureen telling me how to do this <laughs> Wonderful. So I don't see any more questions at the moment. Um, 
I will turn it back to our author team for any sort of final remarks. And I do want to say thank you again for your presentation today. Well, I guess my only final remark would be it's a great course to teach. As uh, two of you have already said, <laughs> the bar is so low that you can't help but exceed it. <laughs> they expect so little from the course. And also, this is very much an in Siders course. This is stuff that nobody but lawyers needs to know. So you're introducing them to insiders law. And that's exciting for them, for you, for all everyone. Yeah, I would I would simply say thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, being here and tuning in. We hope it was helpful for you. Um, and uh, please reach out if you have questions, you know, ad adopters of the book. Um, often write if there are certainly if there are typos or something but but also if there are questions about it uh, well, never there certainly won't be this edition um but, but whether there it's because <laughs> um but but if you have questions about uh you know approaching a certain um a certain yeah. a certain case or a certain aspect of the course we really are available to you um and want to to make um your experience uh, as as seamless as as possible Yes, and, and some of those suggestions have made their way into subsequent editions, and I'm sure we'll do so in the future. So thank you all again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, today's webinar has now ended. Thank you all for joining, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.